was really, really ex extraordinary. And I think we got incredible interviews because it was all done in Spain. It was such a meaningful experience for everybody that was there. Judy is a really terrific producer. We had a really great crew. <laughs> we ate dinner every night at 10.30 because that's what they do in Spain, but we still got up really early the next morning and truffled on um, to the, you know, the next event or next city that the vets were doing because they were touring Spain. Um, so that was the beginning. Uh, of my relationship with Judy, which also lasted till the end, end of her life. Um, I spoke to her very shortly before she passed away. Um, but she, she led such a wonderful life. She led a really full life, a really creative life. She was an incredible community person. Um, and she went on to make other really wonderful films. She made a film called A Home on the Range, which is on Jewish chicken farmers in Petaluma, which nobody had ever heard of. It was like having a kibbutz here in Northern California. Um, and she made that with a woman named Bonnie Burt, which was great. And then the, the film um, In the Image, which is about Palestinian women documenting their lives in the West Bank and what's going on with it. The impetus for that documentation came from her daughter, Jessica's group, Beth Selim. Jessica is a phenomenal human rights activist, really phenomenal. She's won major international prizes. Beth Selim is an, an incredible organization to be in Israel, and it's very difficult for them to operate there. But they were the ones who gave the cameras to these women, and that was a wonderful film that she did with Emmy Charlotte. Well, that was great, and I just want to say that the the um, what, the, what they went to was a homage. It was like a uh, I think it was in 1986. Or it has been the a th a 50th anniversary of of the international brigades and involved all the international brigades who were there there in Spain. And Peter Hartsman, his um, his mother was there. She, both his parents were vets, and his mother was one of the people that Connie and Judy interviewed. Although they didn't use the film, the interview in the film it was a very meaningful experience for Peter, for Peter Hartsman and his family. And Peter, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, my father was Jack Hartsman. He was from Chicago originally. And in 1929, when the depression hit, uh, it was of course difficult for people to find uh, work. So he became active with the unemployment councils and the American League Against Foreign Fascism. Um, when the war started, he uh, volunteered because he felt the democratic government had pledged to develop jobs and give peasants land to work for themselves. And the Civil War was brought on by the oligarchy. When he got to Spain, he was willing to do anything, but since he knew how to drive, he volunteered for the motor pool. My mother was a nurse. Uh, she saw things how how things were going in Spain. She read the Daily Worker, and then she announced to her mother that she was going to go to Spain. Her mother told her to make up her mind that if she went, she was going to stay and help. In other words, it wasn't going to be like a spring break trip. Um, my parents met in Spain in Spain and Spanish Casim. In 1986, they attended the reunion in Barcelona for the commemoration of the International Brigades. And that's where Judy and Connie interviewed my mother. Uh, ultimately, as Richard said, Judy didn't use the interview for Forever Activist, but after several tries, she managed to get me a copy. And that interview provided us, the family, a precious memory, and especially helps our daughters appreciate their heritage because it touched upon not only the Spanish Civil War, but also some family background that might have easily been forgotten. It also reminded me of how much I was influenced by my parents and where some of the attitude came from. Thanks, Richard. Great, well, we'll get more into that later in the second part. So Peter, Peter Carroll, Peter uh, was a chair emeritus of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. He was also the historian of the brigade. So Peter, how did Judy and Judy's film 
fit into the organization, and maybe you could provide some context for that. Peter Carroll. Um, we seem to be having some technical difficulty here. Oh, Peter, I think you need to unmute mute yourself. Got it. Judy's project came at a very uh, uh, important time. If you go back to the age of the veterans, the volunteers, the, the immediate age of, the, of a volunteer from the Lincoln Brigade was about 1909. That's the birth year that most of them, the median turned out to be. And if you add 65 years to that, to their birth, it was around 1980 that they were reaching the age of retirement. Before the 80s, it was very difficult to get them, the veterans, to speak honestly about their past. They had been harassed by the FBI. They thought everybody was working for the CIA. You know, whatever they told their families was half true or they didn't say anything at all. There was a great deal of secrecy. I could hardly get anybody to talk to me. But by 1980, things were loosening up a little bit. ALBA, which is the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives, was founded in 1979 by veterans in New York and began for the purpose of creating a historical archive. And by 1980, there were filmmakers working on a picture called The Good Fight. And, and the veterans were getting a chance to be interviewed, were willing to talk about it selectively. Not everybody was open, but there were many like Ruth David Al and Mill Wolf and others that were quite candid about what went on. And as part of that same spirit, on the West Coast, the veterans realized that if they wanted to preserve their legacy, they had to bring in younger people. And they agreed to, to create a core of what they called associates, which I was asked to be one, one of about six in 1984. And we were, you know, permitted to attend their meetings, to vote at meetings, and to participate in their events. And that's when I could again begin to talk to people and, and interview people informally and so on. Um, and it was right then, at aiming toward 1986, the 50th anniversary, that this event was happening in Spain and Judy was there with her camera in order to take these pictures. Well, it was a very, you know, a convergence. They were now, you know, the average guy was 70 maybe. He knew he wasn't gonna last forever. This was the time to fess up to admit what he didn't want to talk about and, and to boast a little bit about what they were so proud of having done. And she was a great interviewer. She was very easy to talk to. Uh, I know Connie did a lot of the, the legwork there, but there was a softness about it. They, they, weren't, uh, they weren't aggressive interviewers. They were, they were interested. They were people who were simply interested in the story. And uh, she was very fortunate to have that convergence at that time. Of course, Alba went on and goes on, as uh, you, you know, we'll talk about later. I think that uh, gives you what you wanted from me, Richard, context. Well, great, and we'll get more into that in, in the second part. I think now what we're gonna do is Connie, with, with the help of Rick Tata Flores and some music by Randy Craig has put together a three minute clip about Judy. And I think we'll now switch to that and see that clip. Are we ready to switch?
Great. Great. So I just wanted to mention, I just wanted to mention to people that we're, Alba is going to be is recording uh, this program for future use. So I hope that's okay with everybody um, when you ask questions. So, okay, so when I want I, I want to get back to this time of the 1970s. I, I first met Connie in about 1976. At that time, I was involved in a, in a, I was involved as a photographer in a group called the Radical Elders Oral History Project, which consisted of 60s radicals interviewing people who were in their 60s at the time, which meant they'd been activists in the 1930s. We were sort of trying to, we were trying to recover our roots from this historical amnesia of the 1950s. And, me, and I shared some space in a, in a cooperative with a bunch of cooperative filmmakers with Connie. At the time she was doing a film about called The Life and Times of Rosie the Riveter, which is this incredible breakthrough film documenting the history of working women in World War II. Now, Connie, you, you'd been an organizer in the anti-war movement and the women's movement. Why did you and other people are, of our generation get into documentary filmmaking? Well, <clears throat> well, I can talk about in specific getting into films that reclaim our past because that's what's really unique about it. Um, when we were in the movement, we were actually very studious. We read a lot of books and we read about things that happened in the past that no one taught us in school. We learned that history is not made by great men, that it's made by movements. We learned where our unemployment insurance came from and all the organizing in the 30s. And it, it meant a lot to us as, you know, at that point, very young organizers in the late, in the 60s and, and 70s. It was incredibly valuable to us. Um, and having that cross-generational experience. And that's why I think a lot of us, not just me, when we became serious filmmakers, we made stories about histories that weren't told such as Rosie was um, people, uh, women in, and babies and banners, which is about women in the labor movement, union maids. There's a film made then about the Wobblies. All of us were activists in, during that time and, and uh, made those kinds of films in order to learn from the past. We also, I was also in a group called Newsreel and <clears throat> we made a lot of films about what was going on politically in the day uh, and even there, we also reached to our past. The first person I worked with in New York City was a man named Leo Hurwitz. And Leo was part of the film and photo league, which for us in Newsreel was like, you know, us in the 30s. That's who Leo rep represented. Out of his group came the very famous film, Salt of the Earth. Um, so the, the links to a past that is not taught us was so vital. And that's why I also think it's so vital that, that uh, the BALB exists and all the work that people are here today are doing. It's very, very important. Well, that's, that's great. It was, it was, this really was a sense that we had lost in the 50s, all this memory through the McCarthyism it had been lost and, and people are trying to, to recover this stuff. Um, so, and Peter Hartsman, you, you were, or actually, maybe I'll go to, I was going to go to Peter Carroll first. So, Peter, you were actually a historian, one of the, but you were also an activist, and then you became a historian. And originally, we both were in, in, the, um, in the Radical Elders Oral History Project, which is the, how do you then go from the Oral History Project to the Lincoln Brigade Project? Well, uh, Richard, the, uh, well, one thing, there was a member of the Radical Elders named Virginia Malbin, whose husband had been a dentist in the Spanish Civil War, gone over as a volunteer. But she herself had gone to Spain as a social worker. And uh, what were social workers were doing were visiting children, Spanish children, who had been bombed out of their houses and were living in colonias, refugee camps. And these social workers from Chicago, University of Chicago, realized that uh, they sort of invented uh, drawing, you know, colored drawings as a kind of therapy for kids. 
And so this group of women went over, social workers, and there was Ginny talking about the Spanish Civil War. And uh, the radical elders then asked me if I would do interviews, oral histories of two African-American volunteers, one of whom lived in Sacramento, whose name was Shell McDaniels. I spent about 12 hours visiting him and interviewing him. Uh, in fact, uh, no one ever really would have known about him, his remarkable life, had I not done those interviews. I also did a long interview, uh, I mean oral history, which is a little different than an interview, um, of a guy named Vaughn Love, who was in Long Island. And uh, again, six or 12 hours of interviews that really preserves his history. Of course, I'm learning about all this stuff and a lot of the stories that we were picking up needed to be verified and substantiated. And I kept uh, going after this kind of work of uh, pursuing veterans individually. As I said before, some of them wouldn't talk to me, but some did gradually. And uh, as I mentioned before, when the Bay Area post of the VALB opened itself to these selected associate members, we got to work with them. Of course, they were exploiting us because they couldn't necessarily be doing the jobs themselves. One big thing we did was raise money for ambulances to be sent to Nicaragua during the Reagan era when you had the, the Contra Wars going on. And uh, I know I w did a lot of the publicity for that, but we all, Judy worked on that, everybody worked on that stuff, organizing meetings, rallies, getting PR appointments, for local radio and television programs, arguing about uh, opposed to Reagan's policy of um, trying to suppress the the revolution that had happened, and uh, so these people began to watch me working with them, and I guess some of them actually didn't think I worked for the FBI anymore. It took a while, and uh, they said, "Yeah, they talked to me." Mill Wolf was a big breakthrough. He came over here with a box, three cartons, one afternoon which represented all of his personal papers. And he said, here, Carol, do whatever you want with it. And, you know, having documents in your hand that you can actually study. And then you can ask questions of the people that were involved to verify and challenge what you thought you knew and what they thought they knew. Um, I got a lot of cooperation for that. And that brought me ultimately into ALBA, which was already in existence in, in the East Coast. and. Uh, I began to work on my book. I wound up interviewing over a hundred volunteers. But more important was that ALBA becomes the repository for this incredible archive. That archive, I don't know how to describe it, but you know, archival material is put in boxes that are about, each box is about one foot long. And the ALBA collection is about six or 700 linear feet. You can imagine all those boxes lined up. That's what's in them. And that includes the material that, uh, that Judy Montel used for her work. She, she turned over footage and copyrights and things like that to Alba as part of her legacy, as part of that movement. Um, Alba does now teaching programs. We're in the middle of an online course for high school teachers. Uh, Tuesday coming will be the third of five uh, sessions that we're doing for high school teachers, 50 teachers are enrolled. If you do the math, and each teacher does about 100 students a year, 5,000 students are gonna get hit with our propaganda. Um, not propaganda, our history. Um, and we give, uh, you know, Alba's committed, we're activists and we, uh, we give an award for human rights activism every year. We publish the volunteer quarterly magazine for free, if you want to subscribe, go to the ABBA website four times a year. Um, we do an annual gala. We're going to be celebrating the monument in San Francisco very shortly, as soon as we're allowed to have an event in the streets. Uh, probably not before the spring, but there it is. The, the monument has been restored. It's beautiful. Uh, Judy made tapes and films, by the way, of the original ceremony that inaugurated that monument. And you can see people there speaking, including governor, then mayor of San Francisco, um, 
you know what his name is, Gavin Newsom. And uh, you'll see Schwart, uh, Schultz there, who had been a former Secretary of State, was there and the Spanish ambassador and about 12 veterans that were still alive when that was put together. Uh, in fact, we used some of Abe Asheroff's tapes in our teaching programs. So that's my wrap for now. I look forward for your questions too. Okay, well, yeah, but that, that was very interesting. I know how people about about Albo. We're actually going to do a, a an online event of, of the monument since we we're not sure when. It's probably in September, and you guys will hear more about that. I would just like to go back to though to this period. You mentioned that Milt Wolf had brought you, and he actually brought me in as well. But when I first interviewed Milt, he he actually took out a tape recorder and he said, "I'm going to interview you. I know I'm going to make sure you don't misquote me." And he was so paranoid that he wanted to take, and he still wouldn't talk very much. But later he got to know me, especially, and brought me in, especially because he wanted me to teach him about photography and use my darkroom. And he was just a great organizer. But we can't, but I would like to get back to let Peter Hartsman talk a little bit about, he's, he's looking at this from the other side of the looking glass, because he was one of the people, his family, he grew up in the, in the milieu of the Lincoln Brigade with his parents. And he had, and he liked to talk, let him talk a little bit about, for one thing he mentioned to me, when Virginia, he first was taking pictures once and Virginia told him not to take any pictures of her. And I'd like him to talk about what it was like growing up in his family and why people were so paranoid in, in that atmosphere of growing up in the 50s with that parents. Peter. Okay, Richard. Um, the, uh, my family was originally from Chicago, and when, when I was small, I remember going to meetings and uh, fundraisers and, and seeing vets all the time in different different situations. And then in uh, 1957, we moved to Los Angeles, and uh, my father was a machinist, but every time he got a job, uh, the FBI would visit and he would quickly lose the job. So it, it was not a, economically, this was not a good time for us. My mother became the primary uh, income producer for the family. She worked as a nurse, first at uh, Cedars of Lebanon down, down in LA, and then at a, a couple of other hospitals in the San Fernando Valley. Um, but when I was 10, I got, I guess I, I grew up very quickly. Uh, we had a couple of incidents uh, that was very, very formative to me. Um, one day there was a knock at the door and the first, the next thing I knew my mother was slamming the door and it was an FBI agent and I asked my mother, why, why did she do that? And she said, he wanted information about another nurse that went to Spain. So that, that was one item. The other thing that, that sort of uh, was very formative for us was that I learned very quickly about our relatively precarious economic situation. So I learned basically not to be as typical American consumer. I just stopped asking for things that I saw. And you know, I figured I'd get what I needed, but I didn't have to ask for things that weren't necessary. Anyway, um, the uh, the good thing in my family was that I you know I grew up with the vets, so seeing these films, you know both the Judy did and the Good Fight and stuff, these are all people that I knew at various a lot of I knew them, a lot of them at various times in my life, both as growing up and then after I moved to New York for graduate school, I would attend uh, post meetings and I'd get introduced to. To various people, and they'd remind me that they knew me as uh, when I was a child. And a lot of them were, a lot of the vets were people that, that had been patients of my mom when she was a nurse in Spain, you know, like Steve Nelson and Al Prego and Abe Asheroff. They'd all been uh, patients, uh, and uh, they would con constantly remind me about how, how great the care was that they got from her. So, but you know, things were 
we experienced the blacklist, but we were relatively lucky because none of us, none of the family was threatened with jail like some of the other vets were. So that was, that was important for us. Um, anyway, you know, that was uh, when Judy told me about the interview that she had done with my mom, that was really important for us because, it, like I said, it gave us a way to sort of maintain contact after, you know, something that we could look at and hear her speak and hear her voice and hear, you know, hear her express her, her opinions. And it was good to, ha good to have. You also mentioned, uh, I think to me, about seeing um, union maids that, um, um, Julia Reichardt made as another example of film and, and what it meant to you and that you waited in line a long time to see it and um, you knew the people in it. Yeah, I was, I was living, I was going to school, graduate school in New York and uh, one morning I, I had got a copy of the New York Times. It wasn't my favorite newspaper because I, you know, I knew how they, they customized their reporting based on what the market was, but they did have a review of union maids in it. And as I was reading it, I saw that my godmother was one of the people that was that was the subject of the uh, the the film. It was Sylvia Woods, and I had a friend from France whose parents had been in the resistance during World War II, and I called him up and I said, "Look, we got to go see this movie." And we ran from the Greenwich Village, where the NYU was, up to West 23rd Street during the middle of winter across the ice and snow. And we got there in time for the film. So it, it was really good. And later I met, I made contact with Jim Stein, who was also worked on the film with Julia. And I told him, I asked him if I could get a copy of it so I could show it to my, my daughters. And he was kind enough to give give me a copy of the film. So now I, I, have, an, I have a question for you here from um, Elizabeth Q. Uh, should we have, can, can Elizabeth, want, Elizabeth, you'd like to ask this question? I'll see if we can put you on. Otherwise, I'll just read your question. Sure. I, I'm just, I'm not Q. I'm Elizabeth Starchevich. And my, my parents were Abe and Esther Unger. And I'm just kind of curious how the whole um, attack that is very visible in in the film, which talks about uh, anti-communism when they re when the vets returned, which talks about the problems that occurred to them, um, and also shows the McCarthy hearings, etc. And not one of of the people that has spoken today you have has used the word communist, has used the word the way in which that climate created such a difficulty, although you are mentioning bit by bit, oh, yeah. someone mentioned here on the chat, oh, I was sent to my room when, when, the, when the FBI came, or I was, my parents uh, lost their job immediately, my father lost his job immediately. And I think somehow there's, um, there's a hesitation on the part of a generation that comes from people who in fact supported, either supported communism or supported ideals of communism. Not all of people who were attacked were communists, but, but that it doesn't come out historically here is a little bit surprising since this is a sympathetic place. So, I, I mean, I love the film and I'm very glad that I got to see it. So that was my question. Well, the, Aaron said it, not to you, but Peter. Um, Okay, um, I guess to address that is, you know, the, as, as Peter Carroll had mentioned, there was a lot of reluctance to open up to people, especially when you knew, and you sort of carried it through. I mean, as a, as a kid, you know, we talked, to, we talked about Spain a lot within the family, and we talked about, you know, we talked with people that we knew, and when I was in college, I did it an interview with Evelyn Hutchins as part of, as for a history class. She was an ambulance driver in Spain too. But we were also very careful about who we spoke to because, 
you didn't know how it might come back to bite you. Now, you, we can say it's like 50 years later, but it's still, you know, it's still, uh, it's something you sort of grow up with and you become accustomed to. And I, there's nothing I'm, you know, I'm very proud of my parents. And my father was a member of the party. My mother wasn't a member, but she supported it. But we still had to be care. You know, we, there was still a concern that if you said something in the wrong place, somebody might be penalized for that openness. So I don't think it's a question of of uh, repudiating what your beliefs were. It's more just having been conditioned for so many years that it's just something that doesn't come natural to speak about, you know, what, you know, the specific memberships your family might have had. Well, we're old now, you know, so let's hope this can come out a little bit. <laughs> well, I think that's a very great question you ask, and I think it's uh, something to open up a topic of conversation because many times, to do an interview, you were, the inter person you were interviewing told you not to ask them about the Communist Party, and they did not want to talk about the Communist Party. Now, we're, I'm talking about this film, and we have to see Judy's film that was made in 1986. Things have changed now. But that was a little bit of the situation. Um, I don't know if, any of the, if Connie, if you want to say a little bit about that, since I think you encountered some of that. Of, of the People would talk about anything except they were warned you not to talk about communism or ask some questions about it. I mean, we had that little bit of that conversation. Um, and, you know, maybe a little. I can't really totally re remember, <laughs> Richard. I mean, it was is whether I think they talked about it more than in the Good Fight. But this look, this was something that that also you know filmmakers faced when they made films. I mean, when Julia made Union Maids, there were women in Union Maids who were in the Communist Party. When I made Rosie the Riveter, Lola Weichsel had been in the Communist Party. I mean, everybody who was active in the 30s were either in the Socialist Party or the Communist Party. And it did a lot to change um, everything in this country. And that's also why Julia went on to make Seeing Reds. <laughs> so she decided to make a film about the Communist Party because people had been, if it wasn't germane to what was, um, <clears throat> The topic you were dealing with, lots of times it, it got avoided in many, many films that were made about all kinds of, um, you know, activities on, on the left throughout history that were made in the 70s and, and 80s and, and 90s. So I think that it's not just people's own reluctance and um, I think it's also um, uh, in the context of America. Uh, it made everyone afraid of that, okay? Um, and and that's, that something would happen that would uh, discount the film you were making or the issues that you were talking about because the country um, was so anti-communist and it's still anti-communist. <laughs> you know, I mean, how can there still be, uh, you know, uh, what's going on with Cuba? I mean, it's just, it's crazy. It's really, really crazy. But from every, certainly everyone I know uh, all knows the relationship of the Communist Party to the brigades that went to Spain. And it was a, a, a very big relationship. It was, you know, that also, how paranoid people were about it, even, the, uh, that was part of the oppression of people's fear about being about com being called a communist and being a repressed for it, or your friends and your family suffering from it. I mean, this is a really interesting question. I mean, even as late as um, is, is the, the 90s, uh, Milt Wolf at one time we were going to try to do something with uh, Move On, and he said they shouldn't be associated with us because he'd be afraid of the repression that could come on to them if they were associated with the Lincoln Brigade that was, you know, had been identified with the Communist Party. So it, that's part of the oppression that people had to lie about their past um, right. and that sort of thing. Now, I'd like to go to a question from Jo from Josie Urich. Now she's a person who really understands. Her father was Steve Nelson, who I believe went to jail be under the Smith Act. So Josie, would you like to ask your question, or, or maybe just make a comment? Can we switch to Josie or Joe? 
Joe Yurick, that's how she's identified. Uh, how, it's a little cumbersome finding this. Um, yeah. Sorry, uh, it took me a while to unmute. Uh, when I got dressed for today, I put on a red shirt and I said, should I really wear a red shirt? And that shows the power of uh, just how terrified all of us were uh, to be identified as ha having anything to do with the communists. So I understand why this, the interviews did not necessarily call these people out as communists. Um, but if you ask any of those vets, they would have explained to you their position and t told you very clearly that they were communists, most of them, when they went to Spain. But what I wanted to say today was that I felt that the, the film really captured my father explaining the way he would have explained any topic that people ask him. And the, what he talked about in the film was paying money to people who were unemployed. And he gave a, a very interesting explanation about uh, animals that the rich would feed their animals. And I thought listening to this in 2020 is a little bizarre, but from his 1930 perspective, that's how he would have explained it to people who were resistant to um, social security. And uh, th that's why with Peter Hartman, I'm sure it, with his father, uh, when they had those big demonstrations in Chicago in 1930, those unemployed councils, this is where it all came from. So I think that this film, she really was able to pick up their personalities. And if you wanted to understand how Steve Nelson explains things, just look at this film because it really reflects him. Also, uh, Maury Callow, comes through beautifully in the picture. I, I really enjoyed looking at the, the, his enthusiasm, as do the other people that, um, who were interviewed. Uh, so that's basically what my uh, contribution to this is. I really did like the film. Well, thank you. And I'm sure Judy would really love to have heard that since where she probably did at that time. So since Steve was such an amazing person and a person I think that everyone uh, loved. I, I just saw in the, in the um, chat that somebody mentioned Harlan County. And there's the, the film that um, Barbara Koppel made about Harlan County. And Harlan County was actually, I mean, Barbara Koppel is actually mentored by Bill Sussman, who was one of the founders of ALBA. Uh, so I thought it's interesting how Alba has, and the vets really did contribute and tried to contribute to this younger generation or hand things down to the next generation. Richard, yes. Richard may I, I just uh, want to, speaking to this communist question, um, it's true what uh, the reluctance of many of the vets to speak about their communism. I remember interviewing Jim Benet and uh, you know, who never spoke about, uh, he took Fifth Amendments and things like that, or didn't, took First Amendment things and got away with it. And I, I was, he was so likable and we're talking and I said, well, you were in the party, weren't you? And there was a silence and a pause. And then I realized, I said, I shouldn't have asked you that question, should I have? And then he said, yeah, but I'll tell you. And he answered, you know, but among the Lincoln Brigade, this is important to remember, that about 70% were communists or involved with the Young Communist League. There were 30% who are not identified that way. And they got tarred by the same brush that, uh, that was used in the MacArthur period because they were in the Lincoln Brigade. I mean, that's something just to keep in the back of your mind. That's part of the reason why people didn't talk so much about, about the party and their party system. That's all I wanted to comment about that. Yeah, it seemed like there was a very, part of the fear was not just in terms of oppression that might have happened to that particular person, but that then they would be implicating other people who, as you say, would be tarred by the same brush. In the monument that, we're, that we put up, there's a, there's, we put in it um, 
Dr. Barsky, who was a person, a, very, a hero of Milt's because he was a doctor, not because he was a fighter, who then, after the war, um, when they had the committee, the Joint Committee to Aid Refugees, and they were called before the House of American Activities Committee, and because he refused to answer questions that would have been implicated other people, he would then lost his license as a, as a doctor. And it, it, was, it showed the oppression that people felt. At one point, actually, I, an example of this also, a little slight difference, Harry Bridges, if you mentioned to people in the Longshoremen, say, imply that Harry Bridges was a communist, they would attack you. They would see you as the enemy. If you, talk, if you mentioned that to somebody in the Communist Party, that Harry Bridges wasn't a communist, they would attack you and tell you that you're denying the role of the party. So it just, part of the oppression that people have felt is uh, of the truth and the inability to really tell the truth, which also, because you could get other people in, in trouble. Um, I noticed another question in here, I was just looking at the, was about, for Josie, about maybe you should explain what Steve Nelson was in jail for um, under, I, I believe it was under the uh, Smith Act. Well, he was first uh, arrested for sedition. That was a Pennsylvania issue, uh, along with Ben Crothers and Jim Dolson, who was an, a writer for the Daily Worker. That was a 20 year sentence. And then later on, they arrested him for the Smith Act, which was five years. And it was, uh, a very, very hard time because there wasn't one lawyer in the entire state of Pennsylvania that would take on the sedition case. So ultimately he wrote the book, The Volunteers, and it was sold worldwide to the left community. Notice how I cautiously avoid the word communist. And that money was used to bring in lawyers from New York City who had to tell him what to do because they couldn't practice in the state of Pennsylvania. So he was convicted under that and was sent to jail, but then he got out on appeal. And with the Smith Act, which came almost about the, the same time, 1953, 54, they um, actually threw the case out because the, the first people who testified against him under the Sedition Act were all FBI informants and liars, and they had intimidated the witnesses. So the United States Supreme Court said in that case that federal law, the Smith Act, supersedes the Sedition Act. So that was thrown out. And with the Smith Act, all of those, all of those uh, people were so tainted by their testimony that ultimately that was thrown out too. But let me tell you, from 1950, when he was arrested, to about 1957, when it, 58, when it was finally all finished, those were a long eight years. And those are when I was growing up. So that accounts for a lot of my um, reluctance and timidity uh, in terms of um, going forward because we were very, very alone in Pittsburgh. It was uh, anybody, anybody who spoke out or supported us lost their jobs. So it was a, a really uh, tight community of, of supporters, but worldwide and for the, out the whole country, the, the, the movement came behind him and ultimately he won. Well, that's that's great that eventually solidarity can can win out. Um, now, Loretta Eroff would like to hold up a book I'm seeing on the um, chat. Is that from oh, wow. to anyone? Do you want to say a word about Red Channel and what that was? Well, it was, it was basically a, a directory, you know, ev everyone working in Hollywood at the time, including musicians, actors, directors, producers, um, actresses, 
if you had any connection at all whatsoever, you were listed in this book. This is my father's copy. And uh, I keep it right there. Hmm. And maybe you could say a little more about what that meant to be mentioned in the book. Well, as everyone has talked about, well, not everyone, but the, but the mention of um, not wanting people to know is, is a very significant issue. I mean, it's something you could take out and actually uh, do a whole project around it, just that fear and what it meant. What it meant when, uh, before my father passed in the year 2000, that I showed his best friend copies of the Los Angeles Times from the 30s with my father's name this big in the headline, um, being accused and how he was fired immediately in Los Angeles from heading up a 30 person department. Um, his best friend, and they had met in the Young Democrats, didn't know anything about it. He had never seen the newspapers. My father had never talked to him about it. This was the closest person to him. And so when someone, I, I just closed by saying, when someone said, the knock on the door, you know, that means a lot to uh, many of us. And it meant people's lives being turned upside down and, and being in that book meant sort of unemployment. And, um, you know, I, I can remember growing up in L.A., which was in, you know, at the time in the 50s, and my parents telling me stories about, you know, you can, that they had friends who signed a petition and 20 years later, they can never work again. And it was just, and how this, just the fear of, well, this is the best country in the world, but don't say anything or it'll take us all away. It, it, it was a, uh, or a time where I think we only have a couple more minutes left. Do any, if anyone has any particular other questions, they should put them in the chat. We have time for a couple more. If any of the panelists want to jump in with something. Well, I would, I would like to say that, that we should go back to Judy's, you know, contributions. The, uh, you know, these documentary films speak, you know, to hearts and minds. And uh, she was thorough, she was careful. I remember many, many conversations that we had getting a fine point straightened out so it would be as accurate as possible and as nuanced as possible. And then, as I said, she, you know, she generously has given all these, uh, all the footage and the stills and the text you know, to archive. People can go back and refer to it. It's a tremendously complicated past. And uh, she was, it's, it's important to remember that. You know, yes, it's entertaining, it's elevating and all that, but it's enduring. And through the digitization and things like that, you know, it'll go on into the future if you let it. So I just want to give out the, uh, the, the ALBA website where you can also find out information about the um, uh, upcoming events. It's ALBA-VALB.org. And you can also donate there if, if you would like. I noticed, by the way, that a few of you asked about the teaching programs. Um, we've, th this is our first time doing online. That I explained I was, we were in the middle of and uh, we're sure to renew it. Follow the Alba News, the website. We'll probably offer it again in January or February. Uh, we limited the enrollment to 50 and we booked up in no time at all. And the teachers that I'm working with right now are incredibly interested and interesting. They're dedicated teachers, they're activist teachers. And uh, you know, um, just follow what and maybe we can do it more often if you can figure out a, a host besides Alba. Well, great. 
I hope people get in, involved in that. And I just want to thank all the, the panelists and everybody here for watching the film. Uh, and I hope you've all seen Forever Activists. And I guess we're at, at three o'clock, so or five or six o'clock in New York time. So I just want to thank everybody for participating in this and all the panelists. And and I think Judy would be would feel that our work is continuing as well as all the vets. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. Honey? Are you going to close the meeting? Okay.